Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have photojournalist Chris Lee as tonight's guest speaker. Chris is a Korean-American photographer born in Austin, Texas, and raised by his immigrant grandmother. He moved to New York in 2009, certain that he wanted to become a photographer. He ended up taking a job as a bike messenger, which proves that nothing ever goes to waste. His first photo publication was a story about illegal bike racing for the New York Times. Since then, he has had the opportunity to pursue stories on the refugee crisis in Europe, the war against ISIS in Iraq, and the protest movement in the United States. Chris is currently working on a long-term project about the Korean diaspora in Japan. Editorial clients include the New York Times, the New Yorker, Bloomberg Business Week, Glamour Magazine, and MSNBC. He has worked for various NGOs and aid groups such as World Vision, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Robin Hood, and Ground Truth. Among his corporate clients are Oakley, Cannondale, Specialized, and Rafa. Please help me welcome Chris to our lecture series. Yeah, I wanted this to be a little less about um, the greatest hits or whatever. And um, you know, if you want to see that, you can look at my website. Um, I, want, I wanted to take this time and talk about how I came into this industry and uh, how I view this industry and, um, and the things that we as photographers um, can do should do and think about doing. Um, just a little bit, you know, like intro and like, um, I guess, uh, biography. Uh, I was born in Texas, um, San Antonio and Austin, in those, uh, raised in mostly in Austin, but uh, born in San Antonio, uh, on an Air Force base. Um, my father was uh, in the Air Force, and that's a, that's a pretty fast track to, uh, to citizenship and get your, uh, get your two years in. And um, I never went to school for, for this. I never went to school for photography. I, uh, I always joke that I barely graduated high school, which is not far from the truth. Um, I was more concerned at that age, I was more concerned about skateboarding and uh, becoming a pro skateboarder. Um, obviously, that didn't happen. Um, I was woefully underskilled for that. And so I guess like the way that I found photo was uh, was actually through skateboarding. I, I was, um, I wanted to be part of it still, and um, and ph photography was another way that I could uh, that I could participate. Uh, around the age of 19, about like a year after I graduated, um, I um, moved over to New York, one way ticket, and um, was, I was like, I'm going to be a creative. I'm going to do something. You know, I'm I'm already the black sheep of my family, um, as uh, many. Uh, Many immigrant uh, children of immigrants uh, can probably attest to uh, being in the creative field, uh, and uh, I, I picked up a job. I picked up a lot of odd jobs. Um, it was um, anything from selling Christmas trees uh, on the side of the road uh, to working in kitchens. But the thing that I kind of settled on uh, overall was being uh, being a bike messenger. It had like the transportation aspect, which was really nice, and it had like the thrill aspect, which uh, I've gotten hit by more cars than I can count. Um, and uh, there's a couple in there that I don't really remember. Um, uh, and, and I kind of, in photography, that dream of photography was always kind of there, but it never really solidified. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what that actually meant, uh, what it actually meant to be a photographer, um, other than pushing a button. Um, and I guess like I, you know, just like a natural instinct, as as be, as a as I guess like a curious person, I just began photographing a lot of my friends and the and the culture around it. And because there is definitely a, a subculture, a bunch of misfits, kind of like uh, a little punk, a little hip hop, a little like crazy. And um, a I met one day. I met a uh, a photographer named Ashley Gilbertson, and. Uh, he is a photographer with Seven Photo Agency. He's um, probably one of the most um, dedicated and accomplished uh, photographers um, working right now. And he, um, he saw a lot of himself in me and kind of um, was like, 
hey, you got an eye. You have something to say. You have, you know, you can do something with this, uh, with this camera that's not photographing your, you know, shit for brains friends and like getting drunk, you know? Um, and, and I believed him uh, because a lot of what he saw in me like was a reflection of what he kind of came up in. And, and eventually I, uh, as, a, as an experiment, I, uh, I photographed uh, an illegal bike race and it, um, I found a contact uh, through friends of a friend of a friend of a friend at the New York Times. It was like one of those like kind of inboxes that just kind of leads to nowhere. And with the twist of fate, um, I submitted that, that, those pictures and it got picked up by the, um, by the lens blog. Um, I was thoroughly surprised. Did not know that that actually happened. Um, I swear to God, this whole, my whole career is based off of luck at this point. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, 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 didn't know, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but I knew that I, was, I, should have been, I should be shooting, I should be photographing, I should be documenting, you know? And uh, someone like Ash would, um, would tell me like the, the do's and don'ts of journalism. Um, he mentored me in a lot of ways, uh, in ways that I would have never gotten in, um, in any conventional setting. And uh, at the same time, I was photographing this, um, this underground, uh, uh, this illegal boxing, this underground boxing tournament in, uh, in the South Bronx. Um, I considered that the first real journalistic story that I ever really pursued outside of my own realm. And this is it, this was like, this was the tear sheet actually. And so it was that and this, and it was, uh, they weren't really very, they weren't very clever with the, with the, with the name, with the headline. Uh, I was a little disappointed about that. Um, but it was, it was something, it was, it was something. And, uh, and they had me sign a, uh, a contract, a freelancer contract, and I didn't get a, I didn't get a single assignment or a single reply from an email for a year after that. Um, and so I just continued on, being a bike messenger, you know, living with this like kind of what I thought was a pipe dream, and just kind of working odd jobs and just um, on meager wages and just kind of like surviving. And one day after work, uh, one day during work, it was probably around, um, I would say 10 a.m., um, short, like a couple hours after I started my shift, um, the, the work in Baltimore, uh, or the, the protests in Baltimore um, broke out into a riot. And, and like, and it carried on throughout the night. And I phoned in to my boss at the time and I said, I'm so sorry, I need to go. And they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? And, and I said, I need to go to Boston, uh, or Baltimore. I need to go to Baltimore. There's something going on. There's a lot of things going on. Um, and, and, and I'm sorry, I, I don't know when I'll be back. And so I took a train. He said, like, OK, I don't know if I, your job's going to be here. And I was like, that, that's totally fine. And so I took a train to Baltimore, and I spent the, uh, the next five days there. Um, and the amount of money that I had saved up, it was just enough for me to buy a, a one-way train ticket and um, and a couple and, and like uh, maybe like four nights stay at a at a at a really shitty uh, motel, the, like the kind of motel that like perpetually smells like cigarettes, and uh, and I didn't have any, I didn't know anyone, I didn't um, I didn't have any connections, and um, I walked everywhere. I walked till I, my feet bled because I didn't have enough money to pay for a, a car, but I knew that I had to be here. I knew that like to make. Um, I felt for the I felt for the movement. I also felt that I needed to document uh, these things, um, not only to like move my career forward, but also to to understand what this job entails and what this uh, what this act of photographing and documenting entails. Um, I came back uh, with several like bleeding blisters on my feet, and um, in a collection of images, I convinced the New York Times to give me one more. Uh, portfolio review. They saw it and they were impressed with it. They were like, this needs a lot of work, but I see something here. And I said, okay. And so from there, they started, uh, they started uh, hiring me. And that began my career at the New York Times uh, as a 
as a freelance photographer, and um, I've now graduated to what they call permalance, which is uh, they'll never claim me on their team, but they'll always use me. So, <laughs> um, this is, uh, and so that led me to like more ambitious projects. And uh, one of the things that was happening at the time was in 2015, um, the uh, uh, the Arab Spring had led to um, an all-out conflict in Syria, and Syrians were exiting and uh, were, were in exodus of their country and traveling to Europe in massive, massive numbers. And so I took the I took the amount of uh, money that I have in my savings account, and I bought a um, a round-trip ticket uh, to to Turkey, to the Syrian border, to Gaziantep. And uh, not really knowing what to do, and, but knowing that I wanted to be present and photographing this. Um, this is some really early work, and um, just kind of going through, and I traversed 3,000 miles uh, on foot and train and boat. And this is kind of where I really, really learned what it meant to be a photojournalist and a documentary photographer, and the kinds of things that we have to go through in order to properly and what I feel properly tell the story. Um, I made a lot of mistakes. This was, uh, this was definitely the reporting trip uh, or the project that uh, I've made the most mistakes, which oftentimes uh, almost cost me my life, uh, definitely cost me my, a lot of money and my freedom at a certain point. Um, but I met some amazing people along the way and I, this was the first time that I ever wanted to, I saw what was going on and I wanted to create a, a dialogue and, and a visual representation that I wasn't seeing in the news cycles. Um, yes, it was, you know, scenes like this where they're waiting to get uh, sh all shoved into a, a windowless van uh, take, uh, by human smugglers uh, to, um, to, to the coast of Izmir uh, to hop on a boat and, and go, to, go to a Greek island. But it was also pictures like these, where uh, this is Mahmoud, the, uh, he's, um, he's a student at, uh, at the time, a student at Aleppo University, um, that him and his three, uh, two friends, the three of them, um, decided to leave and um, hopefully make a better future for themselves in order to get their family uh, back, uh, back, to, back over to Europe. And um, these were, this was in Turkey, and they were wait, we were waiting on word for uh, their human smuggler, and um, they found uh, two other Syrian girls that uh, fled from a very similar, from a village not far from where they originally came from. And um, you know, their family doesn't have enough money, so they couldn't go, so they were kind of stuck. And it was, and it's just like the, this sense of, you know, kind of intimacy, I feel like, that, were, that was lacking in a lot of ways um, in the coverage. This is Majid. Uh, he's a, um, he's a, a refugee that's taking um, English lessons at the time. And also the, uh, the rise of the, the right wing protesters in Germany. And one of the things that I learned while doing this was, while making, while making this work was, by the way, this, uh, the work was ultimately uh, published in MSNBC. Uh, uh, and one of the things I realized was, as cheesy it may, as, as it may sound, we're all very much more alike than we are different. Um, I, I saw so many of my, my grandmother, for example, she, uh, she fled uh, the northern region of, uh, of uh, Korea when the Korean War was happening, and uh, she had to do. She had to cross. Um, she had to make crossings similar to these. She had to. Uh, she told with her stories that she would tell me during the time. She uh, she could have, you know, Assad here could have been her, and I saw so many of my grandmother's stories in. In these Syrian refugees, in these Afghan Iraqi refugees. Um, and it was, it was only then did I realize that, like, oh man, this was, this was, this was a lot more universal than just like some outcome of an Arab Spring, you know. Waiting in the dead of night, 
uh, for the sun to rise just enough to, to, make, the, uh, to make the crossing in a rubber dinghy. Uh, border crossings in Serbia. So this was, this was a really profound thing. I mean, not only because it was like my first international like project and the first thing that kind of put me onto like this, uh, this world that was much bigger than me, but it was also uh, a realization that I, um, my story is not uh, only, it's not just a Korean story. It's not just a story about Korean American immigrants. It's just not, not only a story about people that look like me, it's, a, it's a much more universal. And, um, and I think that, that connection for me was really, really profound. It, it definitely shaped the way that I approach not only the kinds of stories that I, would per, uh, that I would pursue, but also the way that I would pursue it and the kinds of pictures that I chose to, chose to make. So, so yeah, I mean, that's just like a little intro to myself, but I'm ultimately, you know, the, that kind of stuff, like it just, um, you know, it happens. It, uh, it's like these are long-term projects that we work on, that uh, we as photographers, we work on, and it doesn't, we're not perpetually on these things as much as I would love to be. Um, uh, I think that's very, that's reserved for a very few uh, trust fundy type, type folks. Um, but, uh, but, you know, the, my day-to-day -day is uh, is being a photojournalist. It is uh, working as a photographer for uh, for a newspaper, and it's um, and sometimes I'm always like kind of reminded about that. And so I kind of wanted to show you a little bit of like what the kinds of more interesting things uh, or like the things that stood out in my memory um, uh, recently, and, um, and I mean like in the last, last couple of years. Um, this is. Uh, the, the New York Times sent me down to Texas to uh, photograph the um, Hurricane Harvey that happened a couple of years ago. And this was definitely close to my heart. My editors knew that that was from Texas, so like they, they were like, send him down. He's, he's got a Texas driver's license still. Um, and uh, maybe he'll, he'll make nice with like the local farmers or something. <laughs> uh, this was, uh, this was fresh off of, uh, I was, uh, it was funny because it was, it's fresh off of a, uh, um, uh, I think, I, I believe it was at the time, I, I had just been back about two months, two or three months uh, um, in Iraq. Uh, I was, um, I, w I spent a month in Iraq, and um, which will come, those pictures will come later. But uh, yeah, this was a, uh, a FEMA, um, a FEMA uh, loading station for supplies in, um, in San Antonio, Texas. And I, Ended up, because of the history of the things that I've done in my own personal work, uh, I ended up uh, getting paired with um, the, military, uh, the military reporter, the correspondent for the, uh, for the New York Times, and we did the military beat, which got me into the, the war room for, uh, uh, at Army North in uh, Fort Sam Houston. And we traversed uh, all the... Uh, the um, uh, the the warpath of the, for lack of a better term, uh, of the hurricane in, in Texas, and it was a lot of scenes like this. And like for me, it's like it, 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 it's hard. It's hard to make pictures like this. Not only because it's like it's you know these are places that I've been to and seen as as uh, as a kid growing up. This was in uh, Port Aransas. Uh, there's a it's a big beach town, but it's also like, how do you make how do you make a picture that's um, a little bit more engaging than just like, oh, this is like a toppled house, or this is like, um, a you know, a uh, toppled down uh, um, liquor store. And one of the things that uh, you would often come across are uh, dead livestock uh, from the flooded areas because um, very, there are very many. Still, very many uh, ranchers in uh, in Texas. Uh, we did an embed uh, with um, search and rescue uh, crews with the Air Force. In the de uh, in the dead of night, like this was probably around 11 p.m. in um, flooded areas, uh, rural flooded areas. 
we came across a lot of people that were just literally trapped because like the one road that leads in and out are just completely flooded. This was in Houston proper. And this was actually when, uh, this was actually th uh, several days after the rains had stopped too. So the flooding just would not go down. It was just absolutely astronomical amounts of uh, da uh, damage. And, and I uh, also, f uh, not only that, but I also photographed, I got really involved in photographing a lot of um, student protest movements. I think that um, uh, right now we're at kind of a, uh, a student protest renaissance right now. And I think that uh, this, uh, the kids, definitely the high school kids, are like uh, uh, speaking the, the most truth right now as far as, uh, as, far as public uh, political discourse is going. Um, and so this is just like some work uh, around uh, for, um, this was actually made for a combination of um, uh, Time Magazine, um, Glamour Magazine, and also um, Seven Photo Agency. This was the gun, uh, this was the gun protests um, in uh, Washington, DC. This was uh, some of the, uh, the student uh, walkouts uh, in, um, in New York. And the nice thing with magazine editorial is that you get to kind of play around with uh, different kinds of uh, formats. But I'm always, I'm always uh, impressed, so impressed by these, uh, these young individuals that are willing to kind of, you know, they want to, <laughs> they're like, look, if we're, if we're old enough to, if we were old enough, we would vote against this, but we're not, you know? So we're, this, is our only, this is our only option. <laughs> and, you know, absolutely, they care. They care. They care so much. Um, and oftentimes, they care a lot more than, uh, than uh, their, their parents or the people that are their parents' age. This was actually very recent. This was uh, the last week in um, uh, here in, the, uh, in New York uh, about the climate change, this, uh, the climate strike. And you know, we like we try to do these uh, these we try to make these pictures and look and like kind of not just as like a hey here's a display of information, but just kind of we as creators we want to put in some of our own voices into this, uh, and we want to make a, a particular kind of uh, commentary about it. And when you're lucky, they call you and they run a full page spread about it in Time Magazine. So that was cool. Um, and so, uh, for a while, for like uh, from 2015, 16, 17, into 17, I was uh, really involved in the, um, mostly in 2016, I was really involved in like uh, in the Syrian uh, refugee crisis and, and the, Sy the plight of the Syrians in general. And, um, and this is just like a small, a couple, a couple small snippets um, from uh, trips. Uh, that I've made uh, to the Baqa Valley in Lebanon, to uh, various uh, refugee camps in Jordan, and um, and from that, it's f it followed uh, more work in the Middle East. But I spent most of the uh, the 2016 election uh, uh, watching uh, watching the coverage from uh, little tube TVs in uh, refugee camps in um, uh, in Lebanon, which was really funny to me. I focused a lot. I focus a lot on children because I 
I quickly realized that um, their futures were, uh, were much more in danger than their uh, adult counterparts. Um, it's, it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of amazing how, um, how much they suffer, how much kids uh, always end up suffering, so much more than the adults do. And, um, you know, like the kids that, uh, that I just showed you, like their futures are completely, completely ruined by, um, by senseless conflict. And, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's really a shame. So this is in Iraq. Um, I spent about a month um, on the line of contact um, at, uh, in Mosul. Uh, during the, I would say like the kind of like the really like um, the really uh, busy times during the fight against ISIS, and um, I would say the, you know, w the way that I wanted to uh, the one the thing that really fascinated me about this and really piqued my interest was um, the kind of foreign involvement that uh, that oftentimes uh, things like this um, uh, wars like this. Uh, Attract, and I spent uh, a considerable amount, a few weeks, uh, photographing uh, foreign uh, aid um, volunteers, um, specifically medics, uh, frontline medics um, on the front lines in Mosul. And they came from all over. Um, they came from as far away as uh, Australia, and you know, even pl uh, here uh, in New York. And for me, it was, uh, it was a way, it was, in my opinion, it was a way to illustrate what was going on without necessarily having to put a bunch of guns in the pictures and a bunch of soldiers in the pictures. This was a really hard scene to, this was a really hard scene to actually photograph. Uh, I debated whether I was going to put this picture in there or not. But I think that like you, when we talk about war and, and conflict, um, we, can't really, we can't really skirt over a lot of the lost life. Uh, this was actually the first time I'd actually seen anyone um, breathe their last breath in front of me um, and completely go brain dead and eventually their heart stopped beating. Um, his head is wrapped, he's a 15-year-old uh, young man, and his head is wrapped in bandages because a mortar had fallen uh, near him and uh, shrapnel had completely um, shredded the back of his head. And his, his father, his brother, and his uncle brought him in, and um, he was already a black tag um, kind of coming in. He was breathing, he was, um, but there wasn't a lot, of, a lot of hope left. And all we could do is kind of Clear out the clear out the um, the airways and just ha help him breathe a little bit better until the time passed. But there, what struck me was how quietly it was. You know, um, up until this point, I had seen it, it looked like uh, it looked like a scene from Saving Private Ryan. Like intestines out, people screaming in pain, appendages gone, uh, just horrible, horrible sounds and smells and sights, burning, literally burnt flesh. Um, and, and it's this, what struck me with this one was how quiet and I would say almost peaceful it was, but it was quite possibly one of the most tragic things I've ever seen. And oh, so much so that it actually moved uh, the, um, the doctors that actually see their emergency, these are emergency room doctors that see gunshot wounds, dead people, people dying in front of them every single day. And, and um, yeah, I mean, it was like the entire room just kind of broke, broke down and started like crying. Oftentimes, uh, abandoned houses that, um, that they would reclaim from ISIS uh, fighters would uh, get reappropriated as uh, field, uh, field hospitals. Um, recently, I traveled to uh, Afghanistan and um, 
uh, photographed, uh, they're, they're, go they're, they're going through uh, an immense drought. I mean, not only is Afghanistan going through a very tumultuous time with, um, with, their, fight against, uh, with like, their fight with Taliban and ISIS and, um, and uh, all the, the, uh, the really big political mistakes and military mistakes that the, uh, the U.S. has made. But uh, not only with uh, the armed conflict, but they're also dealing with another, with another fight, which is global warming and climate change. And uh, they're currently in the northern provinces. They're, uh, they're, it's largely underreported, but they're going through an immense, what I would call a 100-year drought. Um, many of the old farmers, the old, old farmers, would say, never have I seen a drought this bad. Um, and their fathers would say, never had, have I seen a drought this bad. Um, this was one of the, in Baghdad province, which is one of the more uh, rural areas, uh, this, was, uh, this was by far one of the largest and busiest um, farms um, in, the, uh, in the province. And um, it looked like this for a year. They're, they haven't been able to sprout anything. And um, this, was, uh, this, was a, this was a valley that's supposed to be sprouting with all sorts of lush greenery. And with that, it comes with uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of consequences, not only with like, a lack of agriculture, which 70% of Afghanistan <laughs> relies on it for its uh, survival, but it also exacerbates like, a lot of existing problems. Uh, clinics, uh, free clinics that are uh, run by humanitarian aid organizations are being completely swamped. And um, they, they have they, the, the, the amount of people that will come through uh, go up like at the time uh, they would say two or three hundred percent and woefully understaffed and again women and children are obviously the ones that um, that suffer the most this was a um, at an internally displaced uh, people's camp um, the uh, village elders from various uh, villages in a district and in a um, uh, in the province in Bagdad province uh, would hold these, um, these very dramatic um, town hall style meetings with humanitarian aid organizations to see what the, the progress is. A lot of the children are suffering from malnourishment. And, and for me, it was, you know, I think that I, I was really conscious of the way that I, uh, that I was photographing um, uh, scenes like this because when you look at pictures of Afghanistan and Iraq, Yemen, you know, anywhere, uh, any conflict zone, uh, they, it tends to have a very similar look and tends to have a very similar language. And I think oftentimes uh, we, we read these in our newspapers and magazines and we don't, real, we realize that, oh, we're getting a very one-sided way of looking at things and, uh, and the visual language and the video, visual um, uh, presentation uh, matters, absolutely. And oftentimes I find that um, Afghanistan is painted in a very dreary, very uh, like dreary um, gray manner in which I got there and I was, this was my first time in Afghanistan, I was just like, wow, you guys are really colorful. Things are really colorful here. Why doesn't anyone photograph you guys like this? Another IDP camp. This was near uh, Herat City, the second largest, um, the second largest uh, uh, city in Afghanistan next to Kabul. And it's uh, it's absolutely horrible in these uh, in these camps. Um, the bread that they're eating and the tea that they're drinking is probably the only meal that they will have for the day. Um, uh, the conditions are obviously horrible. I mean, they're in the middle of uh, their meal. There is a this like a dust storm that just rolls through and blinds everyone. Um, and you know, everyone's in dire straits. You know, it's it's one of those things where no one is really taking it seriously because people dying of um, IEDs, mortars, and AK AK bullets are much more takes precedence while uh, the amount of people that uh, is displaced by, in 2018, were displaced by this drought far exceeded the amount of people that were, ex uh, were displaced by the conflict, by the actual armed conflict. 
And so um, that kind of brings me to this, to this, to the why. Why do we do this? Why do I do this? Why do we? Why do we go out and seek these kinds of things? And and you know, part of it is you know, you kind of like as a photographer, if you want to exist in this space, you kind of have to be involved in these stories. You know, and that's a very pragmatic answer. But but for me, it's. Um, a lot of the things that I work on, especially the things that were presented, were because it reflected a lot of the way that my, my grandmother raised, who raised me and my brother, the things that she went through. Uh, she grew up under uh, Japanese uh, occupation in, uh, during World War II. She grew up having to be pregnant with, uh, as a young woman, had to be pregnant with her first child and escaping um, war and armed conflict during the Korean War. Um, she had to live off of one meal a day at certain points. She had to um, be in fear for her life. And, and for me, it's, on a personal note, looking at these stories is not only a talking about the things that I find important to talk about, but it's also uh, trying to understand the history of the woman that raised me. And, and I think that when we find these personal connections in, our, in the work we do and the way that we see the world and, the, and how we go about documenting it as photographers, I think that that's truly when you start making profound images and things that are, just, are m more than just a presentation of, of information, of here is a nice, Thing to look at, or here is a horrible, gruesome thing that you should be looking at. And, and I think without the, without this sense of, uh, without the sense of connection in our work, I think that a lot of it, it, it really does fall flat. And so where does that, you know, we can't all be working on stuff like this, you know, like constantly. It's just, just not, it's not a, it's not a thing. We're not Jim Noctway, you know. Um, so how do I make money half the time um, as, a, as a freelance photographer? Because uh, no one's going no no to claim me on their staff list. Um, oftentimes, it is through commercial work. But I feel like, it, I feel like there's like this really negative tag with commercial work. Everyone's like, oh, you're selling out. You're like, you know, working for the man. You're, like, you're, you're not doing the things that you, you set out to do. But I find that to be very much the contrary. I, uh, I found a way in the way that I wanted to, like, you know, I, I live by these particular, um, this, uh, this particular, uh, these um, sense of uh, integrity in my work and this, uh, this sense of duty to, like, uh, to understand what my family went through and, like, the issues and, like, what I go through and what I internalize as, uh, as, a, as a minority in America. And, um, I translate, I find ways to translate that into, commercial, uh, into, into the commercial world. And so I was, I'm lucky enough to be able to have, um, to establish the, the connections and be known as a documentary photographer and pitch stories and campaigns with brands that I actually think that are doing that are kind of like not as shitty as like some of the other ones, you know? Uh, and, and pitch stories of, uh, and, and campaigns of people that I feel like represent or embody the issues that I really want to talk about and I want people to concentrate on. Um, this was some work that I did with uh, backcountry.com. It's, uh, if, for those of you ha who haven't heard of it, it's, uh, it's an outdoor re retail, online retailer. Uh, I think it's REI's biggest competitor. And um, I photographed uh, a young, a young uh, professional climber, uh, he's 19 years old, um, just old enough now to compete in the 2020 uh, Olympics. His name is Kai Leitner, and he's a young African-American man that is, uh, is being touted as the future of climbing. I mean, this is a kid that should be on the cover of every single uh, mountain climbing catalog. That should be, kids like him should be on the modeling Patagonia North Face, and uh, but for whatever reason they're not, and it's this it's this thing this trend that I saw in outdoors, 
in the outdoors world that I'm like, why is everyone, why is this, why is the outdoors such a monolith? You know, why there are kids that look like me, that look like him, that are very much head over heels for this kind of stuff. You know, why don't we have that? And and finding ways to kind of insert my own commentary through my work, um, this was this was a way to do it. Another way is something that's a bit of a departure for me, but I, something I feel very uh, strongly about is the representation of gender in male-dominated sports. This was another way for me to get involved in that in that in that way. Um, I had pitched this campaign, uh, this campaign story for Cannondale, uh, the bicycle manufacturer. And uh, they sponsor a all women's, pro women's team. Uh, and uh, for those of you that uh, follow cycling, this was the first year that uh, the world tour, so the, the tour, the tour that the Tour de France actually belongs to, uh, where the women get their own category. They don't have to co-opt like the men's category, but no one was talking about it. I don't know why. I really don't know why. This is like, a, it's, it was like when I found out about it, I was just like, Pfft. and I'm like, did you guys know about this? They're like, yeah, yeah, kind of. And, um, and so I pushed them. I was just like, no, this is like something, this is huge. This is like something that we can work with. And I followed Cannondale, uh, Cannondale um, sponsors uh, an all women's team, and I followed them. And this was another way that I was able to generate money for myself to do these stories, but still live and still talk about the things that I care about. Because again, I truly believe that having a connection to the work, to what actually believing in the things that you do will make, obviously, will make the best work. And at the very end, you know, you just, even if it doesn't, you, just, you don't feel bad about it. So I started, uh, so going back to my grandmother, I started photographing her. She, um, she's getting, she's really old now. She's 93 and surprised that she's even like living and breathing and arguing with me all the time. Um, she lives in LA. Uh, at the time, my, uh, my uncle, um, who was her uh, first, uh, her first uh, eldest son, my dad's, uh, she's my only living grandparent. She's the only one that I actually knew, actually. Um, all my grandparents were either dead or um, uh, I was too young to remember them before they died. Um, and uh, they, and so she was the only one that I knew. And uh, she was, uh, again, she was the one that raised me. And she, she went, at the time my uncle was living in, um, and his family was living in LA. And she went over to take care of him and be close to him. He has since passed away from lung cancer, but uh, she remained. And um, you know, the uh, she she doesn't know how to speak. You know, she knows how to speak two languages, Japanese and Korean, and um, Japanese because of the occupation. And uh, you know, K Town in Koreatown in LA is one of the few places that someone like her can actually like not only live but thrive. And so she we we kept her there, and uh, she lives there um, at, in a hospice and. And I would make periodic visits. There was a time when I, uh, when I actually was, um, took her out of her um, Section 8 housing and then uh, brought her into um, the hospice home. And I stayed there. I lived in LA for um, several, several months. And so this was just like some pictures from a very recent, uh, from a couple recent visits. This is my younger brother. It's weird photographing family because <laughs> you see them in such, it's, it, I, I say that they're, they're the hardest people to uh, photograph because you see them in such a very specific light. You don't see them as actual people. You really don't. You see them as like these like fixtures in your life that is like, they're monolithic and they're like just this one way. And, and, I, and oftentimes I see her as like a very, very strong, proud woman, but very argumentative, very combative, very like, you know, it's like, it's my way or the highway, you know, you're wrong, listen to me, kind of thing. And, you know, as, as, a, as, a, good, uh, as a good grandchild, or at least I try to be, I, I say, you know, yes, Harmony, like, you, you are right, even though you're wrong. Uh, and that wasn't completely racist, what you just said. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, 
and this is my dad. This is my father. Um, you know, oftentimes the, uh, it's it's hard to get those real real human moments uh, because you you don't you miss them. By the time you realize what just happened, you already missed the moment, and it's gone. It's gone forever. And so I find that it's, it's oftentimes I'm making pictures like this, but every once in a while I get to make pictures like this. And, and she, when she lets her guard down and she, when, she, when she becomes, when she starts becoming the person that I, like, I am uh, not the person actually, not the person I imagine in my head, it's, it's, it's quite extraordinary. And it's, um, and I, I'm, const I'm very moved by it. This was, a, this was a really interesting picture because this was at the hospice and like they have volunteers and doctors and nurses and yada, yada, yada. And they come and like they do activities just to kind of keep the brain going. She has dementia. And this is, very, this is like coming out of like a, a, a children's coloring book. And she was very proud of it. She was very proud that she colored within the lines. She was very proud that she made it look pretty, even though I converted it to black and white. Um, and she signed her name on the bottom, uh, Lee Sun-ja. And my, that's my father's hand. And when I saw it, it struck me because that's I mean, that's what she was doing when, um, what I was doing when she was raising me, you know? And it was, sorry, I'm getting a little emotional thinking about it now. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's weird to see that trade places, you know? Um, calling a Korea. My mom. So, one day she wanted to. Uh, she's a very devout Christian. My, um, it's a funny way that it happened. Like she, uh, when my brother was born, he was born with a very rare liver disease, and um, she was a very devout Buddhist before that. Um, and my brother uh, wasn't supposed to live past the age of six, but she, one day, for whatever reason, she said to the Christian God, if you let my grandchild live, um, I will forever uh, dedicate my life to you. And, you know, he's a 29-year-old, um, married, has a, um, has a business, and so she has dedicated her life to the Christian church. Um, for better or for worse, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. Um, but um, con members of her congregation, when she was struggling, um, gave her a lot of money, and she, came, uh, she insisted that, it's like, told my dad, um, we have to pay these people back. And he's like, I don't, I don't think that that's, they, they, um, I don't think they expect you to pay back the money. And, uh, but she insisted, she was just like, would not let it go. And so we went to as many people as we could find based off of her vague memory of like now closed down shops that they, they, that they inhabit. Um, and we, we paid slowly, but surely we paid back a lot of the money and she was very happy about that. Portrait that I made of her. So from that, that that kind of um, led way to a lot of the, um, the personal work. Um, I'm almost out of time. Uh, a lot of that uh, to the personal work that I, uh, that I made, uh, that I began making. Um, kind of talking about and exploring like the different, um, the different ways that the Korean diaspora has uh, kind of um, uh, evolved and like her generation. Uh, I started in Japan, but this is kind of going to go like all, uh, I'm planning to make it go all over. This is, um, this is very early work, uh, early stages of work. Uh, but um, this is about the, uh, the, gener uh, the generation, my grandmother's generation that, um, and their offspring that exists in, uh, that came out of uh, not only the Japanese occupation, but also the Korean War. And so one of the things that exists there are North Korean schools. Um, 
I mean, like the, it's not just about North Korea and South Korea, but like this is just like this was one of the things that just was struck me as interesting uh, uh, part of it, and um, and in an interesting way that it kind of um, evolved. And in a lot of ways, I understand why it exists. Um, within the walls, you are Korean. You are Korean and nothing else. You know, you are not Japanese. You are not Japanese Korean or Korean Japanese. You are Korean. You only speak Korean. You do Korean things. You talk, you know, or like you eat Korean food, you know. But unfortunately, because this was, uh, this was a school system that was bankrolled by the North Korean regime, they also are being taught revisionist history, um, uh, communist ideology, and uh, a love for the supreme leaders. And one of the things that uh, for you, for those of you that uh, follow along in uh, Japanese politics, uh, one of the things that um, uh, that's going on is that uh, much like America, there's a resurgence of uh, the uh, right-wing nationalism, and uh, oftentimes, um, oftentimes that uh, that it, they scapegoat uh, North Koreans or this particular uh, community of uh, of people, uh, North Korean children, school children. Uh, Yasukuni, which is uh, one of the um, Largest uh, Shinto shrines in uh, in uh, in Tokyo, um, which is actually um, uh, a war memorial. Actually, it exists as a war memorial, and it memorializes uh, um, convicted war criminals from uh, Japanese war criminals from uh, World War II. And uh, the the alt right, as you would call it, uh, as we would call it over here in Japan, would um, oftentimes use this as like their Robert Ely, their like kind of like big kind of. Um, uh, base like this is like our symbol of our our plight and our movement. Uh, this woman lives in a um, in a little town in a little hamlet uh, right outside of Tokyo, uh, Kyoto called um, Uturo, and it was a um, that's what the opening image was from, and it was uh, it was a uh, a village that was built for and by uh, conscripted uh, Korean laborers during the uh, during the occupation. Historically Korean neighborhood in Tokyo. Yasukuni again, or sorry, not Uturo again. Uh, one of the oldest North Korean schools in Osaka. The 70 in the back is their, uh, they were, uh, at the time they were celebrating their 70th anniversary. And oftentimes it's, uh, you know, Japanese schools don't look like this, you know? They don't have trash piled up. It very much looks like a, like a majority world country and looks kind of like what I would imagine North Korea to look like, but within the walls within Osaka. One of the things uh, that, was, that stood out to me was uh, a, a lot of the Koreans are uh, either North Korean passport holders or, um, uh, or stateless. And so oftentimes they are the elderly, which uh, Japan is dealing with a population uh, issue. Um, uh, they rely on uh, Korean-run uh, hospice uh, homes. A Korean neighborhood in Kyoto. And because they were seen as a like minority, um, they were often uh, assigned to like the more kind of, um, you know, less than preferable jobs, a lot, a lot of like the bl uh, blue collar labor. Uh, this is a Korean, uh, ethnically Korean guy, third generation, if I remember right, uh, at, a, um, at a masonry. Um, um, factory. This was the final stage of the East, uh, East Asia Cup, uh, North Korea versus South Korea. And uh, you can see the guy in the megaphone is the one, uh, South, uh, one of three South Korean supporters in the, in the crowd in the back. The group of uh, people in the back are North Korean supporters. And so uh, that really that work kind of like it's in progress, you know. It's it's pretty early, you know, and this is what I have so far. But um, again, it it led. These were some at the time, and I still remains like these were some of the what I feel are some of the strongest images that I've made, and um, and it's talking about um, something that's not not only near and dear to my heart, but also in many ways very universal because this is fast forward 50, 70 years into what the Syrians are going through in Germany. And this is what's gonna, this is a clue as to what it might look like, what it might turn into. 
And again, this is a, we are much more alike than we are different. Um, and, you know, we get to, even over here at home, I get to work on, uh, I'm fortunate enough to work on things that are, um, that are very important, that I feel are very important. This was recent work that I made for uh, the New York Times Magazine about criminal justice reform in, um, in Philadelphia, um, historically known as one of the highest um, incarceration rates uh, in the 10 biggest cities in the U.S. Um, and... And with this, with the nice thing with like magazine, magazine editorial within journalism, within, uh, within uh, my, my profession as a photojournalist, is that I get to bring in more stylistic elements. I get to bring in things that, how the hell do you even like illustrate criminal justice reform in a picture, you know? Like, it's, it's when they gave me that assignment, I was just like, what do you expect me to do? I don't, uh, it's like, I, not only do you like, it's like, I was like, are we going to go photograph a trial? They're like, you can't go photograph, uh, like Pennsylvania, P uh, Philadelphia won't let you uh, photograph inside the courthouse when it's in session. I was like, okay, that's, that was my entire plan. So I got to think of something else now. Um, but uh, I, uh, and it's, and part of it was uh, for me, it was like, I, I introduced uh, lights, I introduced strobes, I introduced like a different element that uh, created a particular mood that I was feeling that I felt that uh, the story uh, needed and represented, and and it had some really interesting results. Uh, this this guy right here in the center, he's kind of like the poster boy for um, uh, progressive criminal justice reform. His name is Larry Krasner. He's the um, he's the current uh, Philadelphia district attorney. This was inside one of the uh, inmates in the uh, um, largest. Um, uh, correctional facility in uh, Philadelphia. It's, me it's low to medium security, so that's why there's like it's so large. Uh, when you get to maximum security, it gets like the populations get smaller. Uh, this was a decommissioned uh, correctional facility. Um, at the time when I photographed this, which was like maybe about like four months ago, uh, they had uh, they had just closed it. Literally like months, uh, two months ago uh, since I photographed this. And it was, this is like medieval. It's amazing. It's absolutely medieval. And um, they don't have circulating uh, air or uh, air conditioning or heating. They would have to bring in uh, fans and heaters during like the hot or cold months. Um, public defender, meeting with clients. She is the uh, new director of the Public Defenders um, Organization in Philadelphia. Uh, they're the ones that, if you cannot afford a, a legal, that they, the lawyer that is provided for you comes from this lovely organization now. And she herself re represents uh, that progressive change. Um, the, the portraits that you see, the frame portraits that you see behind her are all the, all the people that came before her. Um, she is a black woman and um, you know, first black woman in a lineage of white men. Um, a monthly uh, meetup um, of the public defenders and clients. That if you're a client, if you're going through the, uh, the justice system and you can't afford any kind of legal counsel, you could come here and they will go step by step, paper, page by page, paperwork by paperwork, form by form with you. Again, trying to create something that's not, and allude to something that's just, just definitely not there. Uh, up, until the, uh, up until I came into the picture, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, the only pictures that, he, uh, that uh, were available of Larry Krasner was him with, with like in front of a bookcase of like his legal books and like his arms folded, looking like very like, look at me. Um, I, I thought that this was like a really interesting picture that I felt like no district attorney was photographed uh, in this position. And, and this is actually a holding cell in the district attorney's office. Um, intake at uh, the correctional facility. Um, this, is a municipal, this is a municipal building in the city, uh, center city in uh, downtown Philadelphia. Uh, one of the most recognizable um, buildings uh, there because you have like these weird monopoly pieces in the, in the courtyard. And uh, uh, the, um, they had this art installation going for a really long time 
about uh, incarcerated individu individuals at the monthly meetup. Those two, um, those two mothers actually have uh, two children, uh, each has, have, have a son, an underage son, um, 13 years old, uh, both of them that are going, that are being what they believe is are maliciously charged um, by the system. Okay. Crime scene. So, um, I want to end with like, you know, it's like there's, you know, we photograph a lot of, this is like a crime scene, you know, we photograph, we photograph a lot, uh, in this profession, we photograph a lot of things that are issues, issues that we need to talk about. Rarely we're, we're, are we ever um, equipped or even smart enough or to, to come up with a solution, you know? And, and a lot of the times it is, it is very much like we need to beat a dead horse. We are beating a dead horse, you know? We are, uh, as a Ashley Gilbertson uh, would like to say to me, uh, it's, it's like punching a brick wall. And, and it does take a lot of, and it does take a lot of dedication to do that, uh, to go through, f spend all this money, time, effort, oftentimes your safety and health and relationships in order to pursue something that ultimately is going to fail uh, and fall in deaf ears. Um, and we can only hope that we are contributing to a conversation, a greater conversation, you know, that maybe our little input might inform another input, might inform another input that might affect a policy change. Um, but every once in a while, every once in a while, we do, we get a, we get a bone thrown at, uh, we get a bone thrown at us and it's like, and, um, and we are able to do something that uh, we hope that we can do every single time we pick up a camera and work on something. Um, this is a uh, African uh, or Nigerian uh, refugee uh, named Tani. He is a, um, he is a current New York State chess champion. Um, he is, at the time of this picture, he was living in a, he was two years into the US and living in a homeless shelter over in um, Gramercy, uh, Gramercy. And uh, he attends PS 116. Um, he lived, uh, or he learned uh, chess um, about a year ago. Well, like year and some change. And uh, he just kept on, from a chess from the chess club and just kept on at kept at it and he became the like the chess champion like of New York State and we did a uh, me and uh, Nicholas Kristof uh, uh, um, an op-ed columnist for the New York Times we did a story about him and um, it went viral uh, to say the least uh, I actually on the way over here I, um, I I saw a picture with him and you know whatever you think about Bill Clinton but like I saw a picture with him and Bill Clinton because he had saw the story and invited Tiny over to his office in Harlem. Uh, and I was like, oh, would you look at that? Um, so, you know, people like uh, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal and, um, and uh, I don't know, a bunch of other celebrities, like, for whatever reason, escaping me. They, they all uh, reposted this and, like, shared it and uh, got a lot of media attention. And um, he's a sharp, sharp kid, um, a kid that, you know, he's like, I, you know, this is my home now. I don't like, you know, I don't think I would have any of these opportunities if I go back to, uh, if I go back to Nigeria, you know. And um, a week later, I found out that my editor called me and said, hey, we're doing a follow-up. And I said, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm uh, on Tani, right? And he's like, yeah, on Tani. And I was like, what's up? He's like, a bunch of stuff happened. And so a few big things. Um, the media attention, it garnered uh, over 200,000 and still growing in the GoFundMe. Um, there are uh, three production companies that are vying for movie rights. Um, immigration uh, lawyers left and right are coming in um, and offering their services pro bono. Uh, his mother was offered multiple jobs. Um, and an anonymous donor, uh, oh, other private schools, uh, private school offered him scholarships. And an anonymous donor 
got, he got him and his family a fully furnished two bedroom over in Stytown and paid a year's rent up front. Mm. And, and that came from a simple story, like a 750 word story and, and some pictures. This is him in his, in his new bed and he's out of the shelters. And I've been to the shelters, it's, not, it's no joke, it's really horrible in there. Um, and every once in a while we get to, we get to do something that's, um, that's, does actually make a change, you know, and it makes this like these really small incremental wins um, make the 99.9% the .9 failure rate worth it. And I don't know, I don't know, I'm very lucky. Uh, to be honest, I'm very lucky and it's very bittersweet. I'm lucky to not only have been able to be part of this, be a participant in this, but I'm also lucky, uh, in it, but it's also bittersweet that we as a society have, to, especially in American society, has to, we deem his story and, and you know, valuable and you have to be extraordinary and like come f do this whole like bootstraps thing to like receive the support, this kind of outpouring of support when in fact um, it is a basic human right. And every person needs, every child needs a strong support of education and family and like and a secure place to just be a fucking kid. And it's bittersweet that, it's sweet that he was able to experience that, but it's also bitter that, you know, that for every, tiny's out, for every tiny out there, there's probably countless other kids that are getting looked over just because, you know, they don't pay, play chess as good as he does. So, yeah, that's it. What does your grandma think of you being a photographer? I mean, you, you all work pretty tight um, growing up. What does she think of this now? That's a complicated question. Um, we are, we are, f we are, f we're close in a lot of ways, but we're, but in so many more ways, it's like, and, and like, and I feel like it's not just, it's uh, oftentimes it's not just a, an immigrant family thing. It's like a lot of people experience this. It's like a parent. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, there's a generational separation, but it's like, it's a, it, whether it be a parent or, or a grand, grandparent or, or whoever, you know, they may know very intimate things about you, but they don't really know you. They, or do they, nor do they really care to know you. Um, they, she thinks as long as like, I'm, I'm not homeless and I'm uh, vaguely um, enjoying what I'm doing, um, she's fine with it. I mean, she doesn't really understand it. She doesn't understand, it's like, oh, that's great that you got published in the newspaper. What do you do again? What, like, what, what's your what's your job again? You know, and so she's and, and and like you know, it used to be, it used to be for a long time, and every once in a while, I'd still get it. Is like, when are you going to get a real job? You know, from like not only my uh, grandmother, but like from my other like fam extended family members. But it's um, it, it's it, there's like this weird disconnect, you know, especially in like I'm in like the um, all my uncles and uh, and aunts uh, uh, all own like. Convenience stores, dry cleaners, you know, your really stereotypical like service jobs, you know, and like I live in the shadow of all these like lawyers in my family now that are my cousins and like they're like, oh, what does Chris do again? <laughs> it's like, yeah. So, you know, I think she's like, as long as she's like, as long as I'm ha uh, healthy and like, you know, and not, um, not getting myself in trouble, that's all she cares about. So, so. She, she had a huge. She had a huge influence on you from the way you talk. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, especially like she, her amongst other things, you know, like has definitely influenced the way that I photograph and the things that I photograph and how, like, and what I choose to photograph, so. First of all, what are the chances that someone who also went to PS116 is like in your audience right now? Is kind I of mean, at this point, I'm just like, yeah, everyone, everyone has a link to this kid, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, my question for you is, um, it's more so on Instagram, you have um, more photos that are, um, that have lighting, that mm -hmm. you are controlling the lighting, mm -hmm. as well as you've got some photos that are black and white, some that are color. How do you make the decision, this is gonna be a black and white story, this one I'm going to use lighting for, this mm -hmm. one I'm not, mm -hmm. so. Um, good question, and it's, um, 
I, I'm not, I'm scared to death as being known as a one note photographer. I'm absolutely scared to death uh, because for me, it's like I, I like photography and this craft that we're all, uh, you know, uh, part of. It's a continuum. It's not just like oh, you stick with one thing and you're that's it. You know, I mean, like uh, um, Salgado shot color once. I'm sure. Uh, my a lot of it. Uh, sometimes it uh, depends on logistics. You know, like in Afghanistan, for example, there's no way that I'm able to like start like putting a strobe next to a bunch of refugees and like, I'm gonna like walk away from that okay, you know? Um, they're gonna get pissed off, like I'm not gonna, I'm gonna disrespect them and it's not, it's not really like what I was going for. Um, a lot of times it's, it's like, I, the natural light or like what I can produce in my eye or in my mind falls a little short and that way, and because of, uh, uh, at least with like what I wanna say with the photograph, and from there I start adding in things like light and, uh, and toning uh, um, uh, choices. With the Korea work, uh, it, it remains all in black and white because of this, um, this, uh, this idea of Han, which is, a generational, uh, which is a generational kind of like psychological like, uh, weight that uh, exists in Koreans. But it also exists in like, uh, it, it, the, the idea of Han also exists in a lot of different ways. Like uh, a generational trauma, uh, similar to generational trauma with like African Americans, similar to generational trauma with like Palestinian refugees so, uh, and like and uh, Jews suffering from uh, the Holocaust. And it's just like it's this kind of weight that of generational oppression that we uh, that exists in uh, in our DNA. Whether it's real or not, I have no idea. But it's uh, I wanted to play in with that, and I think that for me, for those that uh, that know it and experience it, they're Oftentimes they're able to like identify it. They're like, wow, this is how my my parents felt or how I feel. And I just don't I don't know why I can I can't put my finger on it, you know? It's one of the reasons why Korean dramas are so extravagantly melodramatic and it's the way it's the reason why like K pop is so extravagantly extra. I have a few different questions, sure. so I'll try to just breeze through yeah, these in an organized for sure. way. Um, and I apologize if I just missed the answer to this, but I'm just, yep. uh, the first thing is I'm interested in the prison project. Yep. I wanted to know how you got inspired to do that or if it was for uh, a paid project and how you got access and um, if you're still working on or how we can follow that on like social media. Mm -hmm. um, um, currently, I'm not working on it right now just because I have my hands tied with a couple other things, but it is something that I do want to pick up. Um, just because, um, not only because it's an incredibly important thing, but I also think that it's very timely and it's very, it's it's a it's a com it's a it's a conversation that oftentimes is going under the radar, and um, in f you know people are favoring things that Trump said, you know, and so um, the the work came from uh, the work came from me showing a particular body of work that. Um, uh, that I had shot in the past with like activists and stuff like that and uh, in, shot in similar ways uh, to uh, the director of photography and the deputy director of photography at the New York Times Magazine. From there, they were like, okay, this kid's interested. This guy's interested <laughs> and um, we need to, uh, we should think about like maybe putting him on, you know, like we'll see what he does. And, um, and they put me on assignment for about a week in Philly uh, and they gave me, um, it's both great and bad. It's they gave me the, these really loose prompts. It's like, okay, we want to, we want you to explore this concept and this concept and this concept, you know, and uh, uh, and uh, they're like, you should maybe hit up this person, you know, and you should maybe like ex uh, like think about doing this, you know, and uh, the story, the uh, the the writer talked talked about this, so you should maybe go explore that, you know, and so that's kind of where like the the structure came from. And from there, I just kind of was like, whatever I interpreted, they were like, whatever you interpret, that's, that's good with us. Um, and as far as access goes, you'd be surprised at where you can get in with the New York Times. Like, truly, it's kind of amazing. Like, they don't even check credentials or anything. You just say the New York Times, you just like, right away, sir. You know? <laughs> so that's, well, oftentimes, that's what it is. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, and that, that was, a, that was a, an article that was published Mm -hmm. that, okay. Ben With Austin. The... Ben Austin is a writer uh, okay. that uh, that did a story about that, and uh, specifically, uh, like I touched on points that he made, but not necessarily like, like they kept it very separate from us. Okay. 
and um, because they're like, we don't want your photography, we want you, we don't want your image to inform, uh, like to basically like play off of the the article. We want you to create something that is your interpretation of this this abstract idea. Okay, interesting. Yeah, Ben um, Austin is like a great writer too. You should definitely check out his work. Yeah, he, I definitely will. Um, yep, and then the last thing, really quick. Um, how much when like so you're kind of a photojournalist but a secondly mm -hmm. documentary work mm -hmm. um and how much of your work is like structured pictures or uh, there's this whole debate about like whether documentary people just are like shooting and observing or if you're setting up the shot like how much of that do yeah you do? got it great question um absolutely nothing set up i mean well portrait yeah but absolutely nothing shut up, set up like the 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 stuff in the philly Absolutely nothing was set up. I had I was completely hands off. I don't believe in objective journalism. There is no such thing. Uh, we as soon as we like see something, I'm already making up my mind about all you guys. You know, sorry. Um, but what I do believe in is uh, is kind of like getting down to a particular truth of the matter. You know, and like uh, and portraying something accurately that I feel is accurate. You know, and. And I think that like this idea of objective journalism like really, really falls short uh, because there's not, we don't look at news critically. We don't, we, we, we subscribe to this one thing and then we're like, this is it, you know? Um, where it was, and it was never meant to be that, I don't think. Um, and, and I think for, you, uh, for us to accurately understand news and the way that it's presented, we have to look at it from a lot of different ways and think very critically about it. But at the same time, Unfortunately, there are a lot of us that do not have that privilege, do not have that, um, that capacity, whether it's because uh, we haven't had a chance to be educated. We, we are so involved in life shits that we just can't do it, you know? And like, no one, like, I can't fault you for that, you know? But like, but I do, there is a certain interaction, there's a certain dance that goes on, you know, and it's just like, I exist in this space, and after a while, even if I am putting a strobe next to your face, you're gonna start letting your guard down, and that's where I'm gonna, like, get those pictures, and from there, like, I'm able to, like, kind of pick and choose from there. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, like, it's nothing, nothing is set up, and, um, and that's part of, and, like, I don't ever tell anyone to do anything. Natural, yeah, and it's it just kind of like it being in the. It, it's it's about establishing your uh, your presence and relationship with your subjects in order for you to like be present in that moment when that thing happens. And uh, but I'm not gonna lie, there are times when I do feel and I have gotten involved um, in Afghanistan, uh, for example. Just a really quick aside, I don't believe in being a uh, being a uh, a complicit bystander. I, that's just not you're not being a human at that point. Um, even when I was in the, even when I was in like the, uh, the field hospitals with the medics and uh, on the front line, I was carrying in soldiers and civilians on stretchers. There was no way that I can see that a little girl being brought in and there's no way that I can just be like, I'm just a photographer, you know? Um, there was a time when, uh, there, uh, I was photographing an incredibly malnourished girl in, uh, in Afghanistan in an IDP camp. And, um, and the way that I got in was through an NGO. And uh, one of the, a couple of the program directors were with me, and uh, and I was asked, I was talking to them through a translator. And I was like, "What's going on with your with your daughter?" And like, you know, just she's like, "Oh, she's been malnourished. She's dehydrated. We're not getting enough food. Like, she just haven't. We just." And I was like, "Well, did you go see the doctor?" The like, lines are too long. And it's just like, and she was like, literally like going in and out the entire time. And I said, I dropped my camera. And I was like, "We're taking her straight to the. We're taking her straight to the doctor. We're not. I'm not taking any single more uh, single another single picture. You know." And we we actually escorted her to the front of the line and I was just like this girl is about to like get be in serious trouble and there's no way that you can see that and not react you know and I and I think that like if anyone wants to fault me for it that's fine you know like but the thing is it's like it, it, the, the thing with the job is that and the thing that we have to realize is that we are humans first we are people first and uh, being a photographer in these capa in this capacity is a privilege. No one's making us become. No one's making us be a photographer. You know, this is not like a job that like is like you know this is like the last chance thing that we have. You know, but uh, and, that, and with that, that does come a, a great amount of responsibility that we owe to the people that we're photographing. 
Um, Chris, maybe a, a variation of that question, rephrasing that uh -huh. question. You mentioned that when you photographed the protests, uh, there was one time when there was a, a triangle situation there where you had an assignment from Time Magazine, but mm -hmm. also from Glamour, and also you were trying to shoot mm -hmm. for seven. I mean, it's the same event. You have different clients, as it were. How do the different images uh, show, show their needs as well? Um, I should make myself clear, those were multiple events that happened, and I put them all together. Okay. Um, but uh, it does, it does uh, but that uh, question is still valid because um, if I am on assignment for someone, um, the way that, and like this is like something that you guys uh, might learn about, the, the students here at least, and we all deal with as photographers is uh, licensing and copyright issues. And um, I, for the most part, the, at least the things that I care about, I keep the, I make it a point to keep my copyright. There is no way that I'm ever going to res uh, like resign my my the my control over how an image gets used, at least within legal sense, um, with things that I care about and the people that I care about and like the uh, and vulnerable vulnerable people. Um, I have to have the sign. I have to have the final sign off on that. And um, and oftentimes a lot of the people, uh, a lot of the clients that I work for give me that uh, that um, uh, that legal privilege. And um, sorry, the, um, and with uh, when I'm done, f let's say filing for the New York Times and sending over the pictures. Oftentimes, the ones that, that that don't get used and that aren't under embargo, I s disseminate out with my agency. And and with that, you know, like you 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 establish relationship and you get a good sense of who you want to work for, what they stand for. I mean, the New York Times is by f like far from the perfect platform. You know, I have like a myriad of like issues with them. You know, not only their editorial decisions, but also like you know, their hiring decisions and like yada yada yada. But at the same time, we pick our battles and we and we enact ch change and like the and put our put our you know, energy into like the places we think will um, will make the biggest impact. And in my opinion, that paper has that capability, for the same reasons why the cops will just let me ride along with them because I said that I'm from the New York Times. <laughs> but still, let's say, how does Glamour magazine take an interest in those same pictures? Uh, so, did they publish your work in yeah, the end? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and it's and oftentimes, uh, and this is like part of like diversifying your uh, your client list too. Um, there are certain things where I'm like, my God, New York Times is just sick of protest pictures and they just don't want to run anymore. And that's, you know, fair enough, you know. Uh, it seems like there's one like every, every other week now. But the places that don't and the readerships that, uh, I try to concentrate uh, oftentimes on the people, the readerships that don't, maybe aren't picking up the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal on a daily basis. And... Part of that is like people that read Rolling Stone magazine, people that are people that read Glamour magazine, you know, 16-year-old uh, kids, um, and being able to kind of infiltrate their usual like pop culture uh, news with something that has a little bit more substance, in my opinion, is a great way to like kind of disseminate information. And um, unfortunately, with, uh, with uh, my relationship at the time with uh, Glamour Magazine, they were very interested in that. And uh, so I would pitch them all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's all the time we have. Thank you so much, Chris. All right.